You are listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, uh, at least weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht, myself, and very often Benjamin Pieske. And we have designed this podcast to help you reach your potential, lead great science, and serve patients while having a great work-life balance. Today, I'm super happy to have Jenny Davenport back on the show, and we will talk about integrated evidence plans. And yes, this is not just for the people working in medical affairs. That starts much sooner. So stay tuned for a great episode. Have you already signed up for the upcoming conference of the Effective Statistician in November 2024? If not, then just head over to theeffectivestatistician.com. We have a free tier where you can join and we also have an all-access pass. And the earlier you register, the cheaper overall ticket is because, of course, the closer I'm getting to the conference, the more information I have about the conference. So if you bet on this becoming a great conference, And I can tell you, as I'm recording this, there's a lot of great things going on. Then you can actually save some money for you, for your company. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video-on-demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars and much, much more. Head over to PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about all the different PSI activities and become a member of this great society today. Welcome to another episode of The Effective Statistician and today I'm super happy to have Jenny Davenport on the call again. Hi, Jenny. How are you doing? Hi, Alexander. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back again on The Effective Statistician. Yeah. So if you don't know about Jenny, she has been on the show a couple of times already. And we have been leading the special interest group about launch and life cycle. So a lot about things in, in medical affairs for some time. And I recently handed things over, so I'm not a coach anymore, but Julia is. And so if you want to learn more about all the great things this special interest group is doing, then you can just head over to psiweb.org to learn more about this special interest group and also lots of lots of other special interest groups that are there. And so that's enough for the kind of promotion on the special interest group. Also, you know, it is, you can join for free. So it's not really promotion and you can get a lot of benefit from it. And by the way, you don't need to be a, a PSI member or um, any other member. Of course, it's always great to be a PSI member, but you don't need to be a one for this group. Okay, so Jenny has lots of experience in pharma and is working in medical affairs for quite some time. And so that's why I'm really excited to talk about something, a tool that is quite important and a topic across many, many different companies. We'll have probably different names and companies But in many companies, it's called something like the integrated evidence plan. So what is an integrated evidence plan for you? Well, for me, the integrated evidence plan is a comprehensive plan that serves the needs of all functions and geographies across a product's life cycle using a range of methods. Now, Very big, nice definition that is very McKinsey-esque. <laughs> it's very McKinsey-esque. 
But really, the standard evidence plan is intended to be the larger umbrella under which other plans that people might be more familiar with, like the clinical development plan, the access evidence plan, and the evidence that is needed for clinical practice, under which those all can fall. And the intention behind an integrated evidence plan is to minimize duplication of efforts, mm -hmm. to optimize the evidence that's available to support the needs of different stakeholders throughout a product's life cycle. Yeah. So yeah. This leads us to the idea that different people have different needs. Yeah. So you mentioned all functions, geography, and across the assets life cycle. So what kind of functions do we actually speak about within the typical pharma company? Obviously, the first thing you have to do is find a medicine that works. So your first set of stakeholders is always going to be the health authorities, mm -hmm. right? And they have a specific set of requirements. Mm -hmm. But what we have seen over time is that Getting that approval that your medicine is safe and effective is not enough for HTA bodies to pay for it yeah. or for clinicians or patients to use the drug. And why is that? So there's an interesting thing that's happened in pharma, and it, it, it has to do with the fact that we've done a good job of a lot of good medicine. Right. Yeah. And so it's not enough to just show that your drug works. You have to show that it works better than what else is out there. Yeah. Otherwise, people may not be willing to pay for it. Scannell, in his 2012 paper, called this the better than the Beatles problem. <laughs> and I just bring that up because it's a really interesting phenomenon in, in the pharmaceutical industry that. We have to top ourselves. Yep. We have to be absolutely dedicated to doing better than in previous versions of a drug. So, and of course, sometimes maybe you have the first one, yeah, but mm -hmm. there's always standard of care, yeah. Yes. And of course, the standard of care may vary. And then the other point is, of course, the, the price tag that you put on it, yeah. yeah. Even if you're the first one, if your price is too high, people may not pay for it. And what means too high depends on lots of lots of different things. Absolutely. And I think that, that's a fascinating conversation because at least outside the U.S., and the U.S. is catching up, countries have a fixed budget for health care. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going to pay for your new medicine, they may have to stop paying for other medicines. So they really need to get the balance right in order to be able to take care of their population to the extent that we're not talking about private payers. So uh, where the economics work out a little bit different. But I think this is a really interesting point then because... Selecting the price, which statisticians are not always organ, uh, or not frequently involved in, it is an art, um, but it really is based on this idea of what can economies afford. And so the prices for the same drug may vary across different geographies, just like the standard of care does too. Yeah, and it actually varies quite a lot across yeah. different geographies. Yeah, you can... Just Google for the prices that uh, people pay for these new obesity drugs, and you'll very easily see that it varies a lot of, across different countries. Now, we talked about health authorities, so FDA, EMS, the Japanese one, the Chinese one, the Australian one, and so on. Yeah. And then, of course, these national payers or subnational payers in the US insurance organizations that also have went together to form better kind of power from a negotiation point of view and so companies negotiated with these groups of payers. And then there's of course another there are other stakeholders that we also need to take care on. Who are these? 
So I think um, they can be clinicians, they can be pharmaceutical benefit managers, they can be hospitals, they can be a uh, patient advocacy group, they can be the patients themselves, they can be, you know, to the extent that there's pathway and guidelines governing treatment recommendations. Bodies also require evidence of when it might be optimal to use your new medication. Yeah. And that is really important to have in mind. And these different stakeholders are basically matched by different internal functions within pharmaceutical companies. So if you work on phase one, two, three, you probably already work with a regulatory person. Yeah. And then there will be people that work uh, more on the payer side. Yeah. There you will have people that work on a global scale and people that work in all the different countries, the affiliates. Because there's no such thing as a global payer. Yeah. These global organizations always just support the local organizations. The actual negotiations all happen on a local level or even sub-local level. And then, of course, the last part is, well, there's no such thing as a global sales organization. Yeah. So everything that happens on the treating physicians kind of thing, that is all on the, on the local side. Yeah. Yes. Local um, sales department, sales forces, um, however they are called now. So no, exactly. And I, I think that's a really important thing is that there isn't a global healthcare environment. There are local healthcare environments and they have different evidence needs, have different evidence requirements. And sometimes when there's overlap, they can group together to work on a plan to generate their evidence. And sometimes there's not, and they need to decide, are we going to support this product? Is it worth chasing after or or are they unlikely to beat the standard of care and so we're going to let it be yeah and so and finally of course there's also marketing yeah mm -hmm. and my very easy very English between marketing and sales is sales talks to individuals marketing talks to groups yeah so that's for me the very very easy and simple kind of way to talk about it and of course, then there's yes. something similar on the medical side very often, you know, where you have the medical affairs function that falls into people that work more on the, I would say, let's say, medical marketing, you know, so providing content that can be accessed by many people, or the medical scientific liaisons that very often work on a one-to-one -one basis with key opinion leaders or very, very small groups. So what you see then is that over the course of a product's life cycle, from development to post-marketing, the number of stakeholders internally and externally grows. And their ideas about the evidence that they need to support a product also increase. And as we know from Fisher, the idea of bringing a statistician in after data have been generated is uh, putting them in a position to have to do an autopsy to decide what an experiment died of. So what I talked about at the Effective Statistician Conference related to the integrated evidence planning is that the statisticians need to get a seat at the table and need to try to understand what the needs are of these different stakeholders so that they can weigh in on optimal evidence generation plans to support a product's launch and, and address questions throughout the life cycle. The integrated evidence plan always comes with some kind of communication plan around it. Yeah. So don't think about it just as a very big word document or slide set or things like that. Yes, you have that and, or you have a collection of slide sets or things like that, that which are probably living documents. And in addition, you have these kind of communication channels. Yeah. So that all these different people can actually, you know, feed their needs 
into this plan. Yeah, distill it, explain it, combine it, prioritize it, and so on. Absolutely, and I, I think that's a, a really excellent point, is that development plans, for the most part, tend to be fixed at a certain point of time, because that's the definition of providing confirmatory evidence is that you eventually settle on a design, you settle on a profile, you develop uh, your evidence generation based on that plan and you present it to health authorities. But our products uh, are often on the market for a long time, not just five years. It, of course, depends on the, the product line, but it might be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And during that time, one can imagine that things in the healthcare environment emerge that require additional evidence generation. So an integrated evidence plan is not fixed at one point in time. It is begun at one point in time, hopefully well before launch, to identify gaps. And then it is up on a regular basis uh, to understand what remaining evidence gaps exist. These gaps can emerge in response to competitor entry into the marketplace. Some of them can uh, emerge based on competitor exit of the marketplace. <laughs> new safety signals can emerge. You can learn new things about your product. You might get new indications that impact the price, typically going south, <laughs> just because Companies say, fine, if more patient or HTA bodies say, fine, if more patients are going to get this drug, we need a, a little bit of a break on the cost. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if you have multiple indications for your drug, yeah, so it's subsequently um, and actually faster and faster subsequently get to market, then that also means that you will have more and more complex evidence plans. Yeah? Yes. And you just mentioned the clinical studies that we all know about and that we work on it inside out and we're trained on. So that is just one source for the evidence. What are other sources of evidence that we can use for the integrated evidence plan? Well, certainly a big part of access evidence is uh, comparative effectiveness data. And so um, often this is generated via indirect treatment comparisons and network meta-analysis systematic reviews um, that are generated specifically for the access evidence dossier. Uh, some other sources of evidence are, of course, real-world data. As your product hits the market, you can learn a lot about how it is being used and which patients it's being used and, and what new safety signals that you didn't detect during the development program, we're starting to urge, uh, this is a regulatory requirement uh, to monitor that. We'll run or, or subscribe to registries for diseases or for, or for products. There can be fake or clinical studies. There can be chart reviews. You know, there's any number of, of sources of data. Sometimes it's company sponsored and sometimes it is completely independent and it is important for the statistician to understand the implications of all of it for the product. Yeah. Speaking about real-world evidence, of course, we are always interested in real-world evidence for from the product itself. And by definition, you can only get that after you have launched the product. What very often is also required is evidence about the burden of the disease. Who gets treated? What are the current treatments that are used, especially in terms of if you have a complete new class or something like this? How long are patients treated? What are their side uh, effects? What are their symptoms over time? There's a lot about these things as well. Also, patient preferences might play an important role. Yeah? If you have a new drug that works differently than the others, and maybe has a much better efficacy profile, but comes for a cost of a different safety profile. Or you have a drug that is similar in efficacy, but has a different safety profile. Then definitely things about patient preferences will play a role. Also, administration, all kind of different things. 
can play a big role in, in this area. I think it's also a neglected topic that a lot of the stakeholders' questions in the post-approval phase are comparative in nature. Mm -hmm. And so while you need to wait for real-world data on your product to be generated, uh, there is also a need to generate causal evidence about the effectiveness of your product in the real world, which might be all using real-world data as an external control arm and, and things of this nature. Yeah. This is an area that is evolving rapidly. Of course, anytime you don't have a self-contained experiment, there is room for doubt and there is increased complexity. But um, these stakeholder questions are not unimportant. And so it is upon the statisticians you get creative and get it right to at least answer the question. Don't forget to check the conference of the Effective Statistician. This show was created in association with PSI. Thanks to Rain and the team at VVS who helped with the show in the background. And thank you for listening. Reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients. Just be an effective statistician.